Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. We are here to discuss the alarming rise of McCarthyist tactics targeting pro-Palestinian voices, particularly within student groups across colleges and universities nationwide. These individuals exercising their right to peaceful expression find themselves unfairly labeled as anti-Semitic and wrongly associated with foreign adversaries. Furthermore, there have been troubling calls for federal law enforcement to launch investigations into alleged material support. It is imperative for us to confront and counter such intimidation tactics and narratives, which not only undermine the bedrock principles of free expression, but also unfairly demonize legitimate political dialogue. We have a distinguished panel of guest speakers, Mitchell Plitnik and Tar Kabash. Fortunately, Arsalan Iftikhar could not be here today due to a family emergency. Let's introduce our panelists. Mitchell Plitnik, a political analyst and writer, is the president of Rethinking Foreign Policy. He is the author with Mark Lamont Hill of Except for Palestine, The Limits of Progressive Politics, published in February 2021 by the New Press, and writes regularly for Mondevice, and cutting through in the cutting through newsletter. Mitchell's previous positions include vice president of the Foundation for Middle, uh, Middle East Peace, director of the U.S. Office of Bateslam, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, and co-director of Jewish Voice for Peace. His writing has appeared in Haaretz, The New Republic, Responsible Statecraft, Middle East Eye, The New Arab, Middle East Report, Mondevice, the San Francisco Chronicle, Plus 927 Magazine, The Battleground, and other outlets. Quite a legacy. It is. Uh, he's spoken all over the country on Middle East politics and has regularly offered commentary in a wide range of radio and television outlets, including PBS Newswire, Al Jazeera, Al Hura, The O'Reilly Factor, CNBC, Asia, and others. Putin graduated with honors from UC Berkeley in Middle Eastern Studies wrote his thesis on Israeli and Jewish historiography. He earned his master's degree from the University of Maryland College Park School of Public Policy. You can find him on Twitter at MJ Plitnik. Tarek Habash was a political appointee and policy advisor in the Department of Education's Office of Planning, Evaluation and Policy and Development. He worked to overhaul the broken student loan system, provide relief to millions of borrowers, and address inequities across American's higher education system. Tark was the second government official and the only political appointee to resign from the administration due to its policy on Gaza and unrestricted support for Israel's aggression against Palestinians. Prior to joining the government, Habash was a co-founder of the Student Borrower Protection Center, a national research and advocacy nonprofit where he led the organization's investigative work on student loan and consumer finance policies. Habash also spent years at the Century Foundation, working on higher education, affordability, accountability, and consumer protection issues. He holds degrees from Harvard's, <laughs> Harvard's Graduate School of Education and the University of Miami. Thank you. Also, very good resume. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to the both of you for being here today. I really appreciate your presence. Unfortunately, Arsalan Iftahar could not make it. However, we do have you to contribute to this discussion, and it's an important discussion. And by the way, my name is Naila Mohammed. I'm the Director of Policy and Strategy at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, we're here to discuss the the rise of McCarthyism, the rise of Islamophobia, the fears that are mongering on college campuses. And so the first question I'm going to push towards Mitchell, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. Mitchell, the Jewish community is deeply divided over Israel's operations in Gaza. And this is reflected in many ways, none more visibly than on college campuses, where you've there's accusations of anti-Semitism, ties to terrorist organizations, and there's an overall indifference to the phenomenon leveled against many universities. What can you tell us about the reality for Jewish students on campus in the United States? Because what is shown on the media is quite different from what is told on the ground. Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a few points to make. Um, for one thing, you know, the, the, the Jewish experience on campus 
like the Jewish experience anywhere else, is diverse and different people experience what's happening and experience this moment in different ways. That being said, the attempt to use um, real discomfort and, uh, of, of Jewish students who support Israel um, as a means to silence dissent and silence protest uh, just echoes some of the worst parts of American history that we that we've, we've ever seen. <clears throat> um, you know, one thing I think is important to note is the Jewish students who support Israel, who even support Israel's horrific actions right now in in Gaza, um, and feel uncomfortable on campus, feel nervous, feel af even afraid. Those feelings are not, you know. Those feelings are not, when they say that, those feelings are not false. They're, they're real. They feel these things. The question is, why do they feel these things? So there's a few different answers there. First, um, you know, a campus and any university, any institution of learning is not a place to feel completely comfortable all the time. That's not the idea. You should be challenged. You should be hearing things you disagree with, even things you object to. Um, you, that is what's called learning. Um, that, that is what a university is there for. Um, I have, in my own uh, time, advocated against uh, progressives who have sought to silence right-wing speakers. Now, there's, there's a line, of course, when, when you know, uh, 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 I forget the guy's name, but, but uh, Jan, Jan, Jan is something. Um, um, a right-wing person who was actually, like, you know, advocating like pedophilia and things that are really <laughs> horrible. Yeah, there's a line that, 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 you know, that, that you can draw. But for the most part, I think we need to hear opinions, um, including maybe even especially opinions we object to. I don't think we defeat any sort of uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, homophobia, any of that by silencing it, by smothering it. Um, so, you know, that, that, there's, there's that, and that is something that all students um, should, and, and all you know, faculty should be living with. But there's a, another dimension for Jewish students right now on campus who support Israel. And that is when they hear things like, uh, long live the Intifada, from the river to the sea, Palestine should be free, they have been told over and over and over again that this means kill the Jews. That's, that that is what that actually means. That is a lie that they have been told repeatedly and are still being told repeatedly every day. I see it, you know, I'm sure many of you do too. You see it on the news, see it on social media. It's being told over and over. It is not true. Um, we see objections to the protests that say, well, when you say this, you really are saying this. Well, you know, telling other people what they're saying is not usually very helpful and is usually not very accurate. Um, so, but, but Jewish students are convinced of that. So I think, you know, when we see some Jewish students say that they are afraid of those things, rather than ridicule them or belittle their feelings, we should be engaging them and saying, listen, you're hearing something that's not there. Um, so I think there, there's that part of it. The other, I think, you know, really key issue, and I think it's obvious, is that many, many, many Jewish students are part of this protest movement. Um, Jews are, are both overrepresented in the protest movement, also they are overrepresented in those who are being arrested. Um, partially, I think, because a Jewish student speaking out against the genocide in Gaza uh, is particularly dangerous, is seen as particularly undermining support for that. So, um, you know, there are many, many different pieces of this, but all of it is, I think, tragically cynical and tragically not, uh, uh, or tragically indifferent to the actual well-being of, of all Jewish students who are being put in great peril because their situation on campus is being uh, politicized. When the Anti-Defamation anti League recently put out a report card of various campuses uh, and how they deal with anti-Semitism, virtually all of them got an F or a D. And no less a, a, an institution than Hillel, which is the National Jewish Student, uh, uh, College Student uh, Organization. Hillel is, is very distinctly Zionist. They have barred uh, anti-Zionist Jews from some of their chapters. Okay? They are not people here who are particularly sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. Even Hillel came out and said, this is ridiculous. This is not the Jewish experience on campus. Jews are not afraid for their lives being on campus. It's not to say that they don't sometimes hear some things that worry them. 
Um, I have a nephew who goes to Rutgers. Um, I know there have been some instances that have made him nervous, that have made him even frightened. Uh, yeah, things, uh, graffiti th uh, drawn on his uh, dormitory, uh, eggs thrown uh, at them um, on, on um, Jewish holidays, um, particularly targeting Jews. These things can be intimidating and nervous, and, and the schools should deal with them, incidentally. Not police, certainly not Congress. Um, so um, These incidents occurred to your nephew after uh, no, this October was before 7th? October 7th. Before. But then how, I have so many questions for you, but <laughs> maybe I should jump to Tariq and then jump back to the question because it feels like the fear for Jewish students is real, but in a way it's uh, being manufactured by an outside Absolutely. source. Um, Tariq, let me jump to you really quickly. You served in the Biden administration. You were appointed, you, were champion, you championed many of the policy goals to improve higher education today. Um, but we're, what we're seeing now, however, feels like the American higher education system is taking many steps back, particularly as it relates to how universities are responding to student activism and critical thinking, as uh, Mitchell mentioned. Um, hundreds of pro-Palestinian students nationwide have been arrested on their college campuses for peacefully demonstrating. From your perspective, what is the risk for colleges and universities in their responses? And how should they be responding? How should the Department of Education be responding to protect students and their freedom of speech? Thanks so much, Nyla. And I just want to say thank you for this opportunity just to engage in this conversation. And honestly, I could probably listen to Mitchell talk <laughs> the entire time. So if same, we want to just let same, him talk, yeah. you know, I just feel like I'm always learning. Um, don't, don't, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do want to hit on a couple of things that he said because it is so critical. Just the basic tenets of higher education has always been to challenge ideas through learning. And it is so important that we don't diminish what higher education is meant to be, both in terms of academic independence and academic freedom, but also how the institutions were actually built to begin with, which is a sense of um, a sense of critical thinking and engagement between faculty, staff, and students, and the role that faculty actually have to play in helping shape the minds of students across the country. Mm -hmm. This is something that we've seen for centuries in American higher education, and it is so important that we don't lose sight about that because, to your question, what are the risks to American higher education, I think it's an existential risk. I think it's a risk <coughs> that we lose that independence and the academic integrity that comes with allowing students to learn and be uncomfortable mm -hmm. and to be in these situations where, you know, they may hear some things that they disagree with or that they don't like, but in circumstances where they are overwhelmingly nonviolent, where they are not, um, they are not actually like hateful and they're actually just trying to express themselves. Like students are learning, students are young. You know, I think we have an obligation to create safe spaces for people to maybe be wrong and maybe make mistakes. There is obviously very clear lines and differences where those mistakes become violent against other people. Right. Um, I don't think that we've really overwhelmingly like have not crossed those lines from the student perspective. But these responses that we're getting from university leaders are actually escalating the repression of what students can do and say on their campuses. And in some situations, we're even seeing university leaders, university presidents in particular, go so far as to change the bylaws of their institutions right. to make the things that students are doing against their own rules and policies and circumventing their faculty's role in determining and making those policies on college campuses. And so when I say that there is an existential risk for American higher education, it is because what is actually happening is going so far beyond what we've seen institutions of higher education ever do in the past. Now, we have seen an overreaction from university leaders in other situations where there have been student activism and student protests in the 60s when we saw student protests um, against the Vietnam War. Again, largely peaceful, nonviolent activism from students in response to a, a aggressive war against right. another group of people. And the response was bringing 
police right. bringing the National Guard, right. and we saw people lose their lives on college campuses. Yeah. That Kent is something State that University. is a stain yes. on higher education. You know, that is something that higher education institutions regard as one of the darkest times in American higher education's right. existence. Right. And so when we think about that and we think about the responses that we're seeing from university leaders, from college presidents, it is kind of this re reemergence and the, the repression that we're seeing, the weaponization of language that we are seeing that Mitchell kind of touched on and alluded to, and I'm sure he's gonna talk a lot more about, I think is really, really dangerous because it makes everyone less safe. It doesn't just make the, the uh, black and brown students, the Muslim students, the Arab students, the Palestinian students less safe, but it also makes the Jewish students less safe because what it's doing, it's undermining real and dangerous anti-Semitism that Mitchell talked about. Right. We have been seeing grow here in the United States, but when organizations like the ADL try and conflate student activism against a plausible genocide, when you conflate, you know, solidarity with Palestinian civilians who are under an aggressive assault in Gaza right now, when you conflate a manufactured famine with real anti-Semitism yes. and like hatred against the Jewish people, it doesn't make Jewish people more safe. It makes no. them less safe because now people doubt the legitimacy of anti-Semitism. That is actually happening. We have seen it. We know that it exists. And like as a Palestinian, I know that it makes my peers less safe. I know it makes me less safe because now brown people, Arabs, Palestinians, Muslims, like they're the ones that are being held responsible for this weaponization. And it's really problematic because the, the hate isn't coming from the Arab community. It's not coming from the Muslim community. It's largely coming from a white supremacist arm within our communities that's really dangerous and that we've seen starting to reemerge for years and years. No, you're absolutely right. It is becoming a very dangerous environment, um, and we're really concerned about it. But the core of the issue of what the students are protesting is genocide, right, and divestment. Now let me switch gears towards genocide for a moment. Now, Mitchell, you are a formal employee of an Israeli human rights group, B'Teslam, um, questions of international law have been prominent since the beginning of this war that started on October 7th. And, um, you know, there is great debate over whether Israel's actions in Gaza constitute genocide. Um, South Africa took uh, Israel to the ICJ. Um, there, there is a large call and lots of parallels uh, between South Africa and what is happening in Israel at the moment. Um, how do you read international humanitarian law um, regarding this issue? So, you know, w we hear a lot the phrase uh, plausible genocide. So that, that came about because of the International Court of Justice. And, and they ruled that there was a plausible case uh, that Israel was in the process of committing genocide in Gaza. The thing is, all that meant was that it's not just made up out of thin air, right? That all that meant all that meant was that the court can consider the question. Um, I have used the phrase genocide to describe what's going on in Gaza from the beginning. I continue to use it. Um, I feel very comfortable using it. That being said, I'll be shocked if the ICJ actually comes back with a ruling that Israel's committing genocide. There's a difference between language and law, and I think that is something that's really important. So, in terms of law. The bar for genocide is incredibly high. You have to do a lot of the things that Israel's doing, but basically are things that are done by oppressive regimes and in war pretty much all the time. So it, it, it you know, basically is killing, destruction, all of those things. And you have to do it with the, with the demonstrated intent of destroying a nation uh, uh, a nation's existence in part or whole. So it can be, so for example, we, we look at the classic example of genocide, the Holocaust, and we say, you know, this was the Nazis in, in terms of uh, the, the people they were targeting, which were first and foremost Jews, um, they wanted to rid Europe of Jews. They, you know, whether or not they would have continued this campaign in Africa and in, in America, who knows, but um, that is enough for it to be genocide, just that they were doing it in Europe. In my view, 
I believe that Israel's intent in Gaza from the beginning of this, from the day October uh, uh, of the October 7th attack, I believe that this government's intention was to destroy the Palestinian national movement. That is why they didn't target Hamas from, from the beginning. That is why so much civilian infrastructure has been targeted. That's why there's been a very significant escalation on the West Bank, despite the fact that there's been very little Palestinian uh, militant activity on the West Bank since October 7th, um, why that has been gradually escalating all along. I believe that. Um, and I think the actions prove that. That's language. And that is why I am comfortable using the language genocide, because that is what I believe. Can I prove it in a court of law? I can't. And that's why I don't think it's going to actually be uh, uh, something that um, will be proven to the ICJ's uh, uh, satisfaction. And in fact, we kind of don't want it to, honestly, because it's almost impossible to prove genocide until the genocide's over. So sure. we're, we're, I think we're all kind of, we're all agreed that we would like it to stop today. Um, and I think it would be, it would be, uh, the, the ICJ will not come back with that ruling. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident in saying that. And yet I'm very, very confident in calling this a genocide. Um, I think from, from the beginning, we heard Yoav Gallant uh, say we're dealing with human animals, and, but also saying how Israel was going to prosecute the war. We're going to cut off food. We're going to cut off water. We're going to cut off electricity. We're going to cut off all the basic necessities of life. That's not targeting Hamas, by definition. That's targeting the population. And, it's not, and, and that's not just collective punishment. That is actually trying to, to, to inflict enormous harm on the civilian population that goes way beyond it. I think it's also important, if we're talking about international law, to, to keep in mind that what happened on October 7th was also a violation, a very severe one, of international law. And I think also, if we're talking about language, we can talk about a real missed opportunity. Hamas and Palestinian militant groups in general had a great opportunity that day because they had found a way to breach the barrier and, and infiltrate Israel. Had they limited their targets to the military installations that were the chief targets that they were, uh, that they were supposed to be going after, uh, according to, to their own statements, that was the, the main targets were supposed to be military installations. Had they not attacked a rave, had they not attacked the kibbutzim that were on, uh, on uh, the Gaza border, this would have been a very, very different picture because Palestinians under international law, and this is completely lost, I think, in the, in, in the United States, in Europe, in the United Kingdom, Palestinians under international law have the right to resist, including by violent means. Okay, that does not, however, mean they can do whatever they want. That does not give them carte blanche to attack civilians um, in, in Israel, even though those civilians, yes, are part of a regime that has been dispossessing them for 75 years and they have some really serious grievances. Civilians are still protected. Non-combatants are still protected. And the fact that Israel throws that to the side and, and attacks non-combatants all over does not mean it's okay for, other, for another party to do the same. So, and here was an opportunity on October 7th where they could have really won a lot of hearts and minds um, uh, in, 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 and, and I think really had an overwhelming wave um, that, uh, uh, of support around the world that could have prevented a lot of what's happened since had they stuck to military targets, which does not mean they, that nobody, no innocents would get killed. When you fight, when you have these things going on, innocents get killed. That's the way it is. But there's a difference between innocents getting killed and actually targeting towns, actually going through raves, actually going through, you know, at, at not to mention some of the things that were done, um, it, including sexual assaults, including which, while being having been over, you know, the, this is, again, two sides. Again, language questions are very big here because on the one hand, those things happened. On the other hand, Israel also made up horrible stories about things that didn't happen just to freak everybody out and get more and more support for the genocide that I'm going to say again that they're pursuing in Gaza. So, you know, international law has actually a lot to say about all of this, and I think it's a really great standard. And I think if we, once this is over, we can look back at this and say, this is why we need international law that matters, because all I'm talking about right now is theory. I'm sure you're gonna get a lot of questions <laughs> for that response, um, but I'll move on to Tharika. Tharik, you talked a lot 
uh, in the past about the dehumanization of Palestinians. We spoke about this as well, Palestinians and Arabs, and the rise of Islamophobia across the country. We've seen a stark rise in Islamophobia, um, particularly how that dehumanization has increased in the last six months. What do you think are the biggest contributors to this and how these communities are perceived and affected across the countries? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And, you know, there are a lot of contributors, but I think for my entire lifetime, one of the biggest contributors has been the constant dehumanization from our elected leaders, from the media, you know, the idea that we have seen Muslims and Arabs and Palestinians be made out to be just in every single consumed media, whether it be TV shows or movies Type or casting. in the press. Yeah, like like we are just looked at, we are, you know, we're less than human. We are the bad guys in every show. We are here to end Western civilization. Like that's not who Arabs are. That's not who Palestinians are. That's not who Muslims are. Like there are millions of us across the country, you know, like we want, to be just viewed and treated as human. I think like we have the same emotions that everyone else does. We bleed the same blood. I think like everyone understands that like they just want to be accepted by their communities. And I think we have seen even in the last six months language from the president of the United States, from members of Congress that have essentially said like Palestinians don't matter, right. both in action and in language, like the president discounting whether the numbers of Palestinian <laughs> deaths were accurate, you know, the idea that like Palestinians or anyone would like use a hospital basement as a military base when there are people who are dying and need treatment, like those types of things that have since been debunked. Like just the idea that like you have leaders in the most powerful country in the world trying to undermine the legitimacy and humanity of people means that, you know, it is okay to discount them. And like for me as a Palestinian, for me as a Palestinian Christian, the idea that like you can erase part of my identity or all of my identity or discount any part of that humanity is really, really, really um, critical to what has led us to this point and what has allowed for um, the level of dehumanization that we're seeing. And I think this is part of, just to bring it back to like what's happening here at home, like this is why you see people feel like they can go out into the street and shoot college students <laughs> wearing kafiyas speaking in Arabic over Thanksgiving. This is why you have landlords stabbing six-year-old boys in their homes because they believe that these kids are gonna grow up to be terrorists. That's not what's happening. These are people who wanna to contribute to society, who wanna to contribute to their communities, and this is what college students today are protesting. They're protesting the idea that we have to treat Palestinians as less than human. They are saying that like Palestinians deserve life. So like when we're talking about genocide, when we're talking about what our tax dollars are doing in Gaza, when we're talking about how we are providing unrestricted military support to an Israeli government that is starving millions of Palestinians right now. I think I just saw a video yesterday of <laughs> humanitarian aid, mostly food, that was in Rafah, that was on fire. Like, this is still happening, and we're not talking about it. It's not being talked about in the news. All of that is happening because it is okay to continuously dehumanize Palestinians. And so, like, when you see college students setting up solidarity encampments, they're not doing it because they want to be, um, you know, like, cool. They're not doing it because it is, like, the thing to do. They're not doing it because they want attention. They don't want attention for themselves. They continuously try to center Palestinians and Palestinian voices across over 75 campuses right now. That is what's happening, and they are willing to deal with like potential very real consequences, including having aggressive police action come on them because they want to humanize Palestinians. And it is in my lifetime, the first time I have felt that level of support and solidarity from other people. It's not hateful, it is nonviolent, it's peaceful, it's supportive. 
And I think that's really important. And just like coming back to like what Mitchell was talking about, like just recentering like what is happening, like as you're talking about a genocide, like they're not just trying to humanize Palestinians, they're trying to take direct action within the tools and their universities and their, their own policies by trying to change the conversation about what what is within their power. And through that collective action, through that collective power, they're trying to say, not only can we just condemn the horrific violence against Palestinian civilians, we can show power through our policies. We can stop investing in the military industrial complex that is supporting what is happening in Gaza. We can actually take action to make changes here at home so that we can have an impact in supporting the humanity of Palestinians who are suffering every single day. Thank you so much for that answer. And I, I remember we had a conversation, Tarek, and I mm -hmm. asked you a very pointed and specific question. Yeah. And I, it was be for my own knowledge. Yeah. I wanted to know when I asked you this question, do you think that the rise of Islamophobia um, and this hate that's, that's coming up, is it Muslim specific? Or do you think there is a white supremacist element to this? Um, it, because because obviously you're, you you come from generations of Christians, right? Yeah. You're you're Christian Palestinian, and oftentimes uh, Christian identities, Jewish identities, are buried yeah. underneath this political chaos and mess that's happening right now. And oftentimes, when violence does occur, it occurs under the guise of Islamophobia, yeah. right? But it's more than just Islamophobia. It very much exists. It very much is on the rise. But is there? a bigger issue that we're facing yeah. in this country. And did you see that while you were working within the administration? Because personally, as a former government employee as well, it's very hard to push uh, a narrative that is counter to what the administration believes. So did you face pushback as yeah. a Palestinian or Palestinian Christian even? Yeah, I mean, I just to your point, yes. I think that this is not solely an issue of Islamophobia. This is an issue of white supremacy in some form or fashion and the the racism that has like kind of like permeated our society against brown people and people who can be classified as one thing or another and unfortunately it has been easiest to express that dehumanization and racism through the lens of Islamophobia, in part because, especially in the post 9-11 world, we saw like Muslim extremism as like the boogeyman. And so anyone who is Middle Eastern or Arab is classified within that umbrella of Islamophobia. Like when you talk about like the hate that like reaches those people, but there is very much a hatred of um, and like hate that we see of Arabs, of Palestinians in particular. Um, and I think to your point, like as a Palestinian who descends from generations of Palestinian Christians, like if like for people who are Christian and who think about like the very roots of Christianity, like like my family like descends from the people who were as about as close to Jesus as like you can get. Mm -hmm. Like Palestinian Christians are the first Christians. Like when you talk about like the churches in Gaza that were bombed in October and November, like those are literally some of the first churches in the world. And so like at like as an Orthodox Christian who like is celebrating Easter next week because there's like a slightly different calendar, like this is like this is so close to my heart because I repeatedly try to emphasize like that Palestinians are diverse. We are not a monolith, both in our thinking, in our religion, in how we look. Like I have family members with with blonde and red hair. Like they are 100% Palestinian, you know? That like we, like we need to also like understand that like the identity is not like exclusively like this is like your race and you're in this box and that's who you are in the same way that like your religion does not fully like like encompass the Palestinian identity because pre-1948 I had aunts and uncles who lived in uh, Yaffa which is like on the coast um, and where is now in like modern day Israel but like they always told me stories about how they would have friends who were Palestinian Jewish people, Palestinian Muslim people, and they all just like 
interacted together all the time. Like the region has not ever been one religion, you know, and there has been like less of a representation of Christians in the reason in the region for a lot of different reasons. But Palestinian Christians continue to be oppressed uh, under the continuous occupation by the Israeli government for for decades. And so it's not just Muslims that are being affected, but what we hear about in the media, what we hear about from our government is that this is a Jewish versus Muslim issue. And that could not be further from the truth. This has this does not have to do with religion. This has to do with land. This has to do with the fact that there was a movement after World War II to resettle a European Jewish population, and there were already Jewish people in the region. Like, it's not that there were no Jewish people and that all the Jewish people moved there. Like, it was a diverse region, and understanding that is really critical to understanding how both like Palestinian life is a lot more complicated, but also how we talk about this conflict, how we talk about this region, erases a lot of people's identity, mine included, because I am Christian. I just really, I just want to add really quickly, you know, part of this, again, it's a bit of a theme of what I'm saying, comes back to language, and we don't really have the right language for what we're talking about. So, you know, like, I have this report, uh, that I, I published with Professor Sahar Aziz of the Rutgers University uh, Center for Security, Race, and Rights. It's called Presumptively Anti-Semitic Islamophobic Tropes in the Palestine-Israel Discourse. But what we're really talking about is exactly this, this sort of white supremacist, white nationalist even discourse, because when we look at who is spreading this stuff, it's the same people who are spreading all the other white nationalist um, uh, sort of ideologies. It's written, people, Richard Spencer, uh, you know, the various people who we are very familiar with over the years, um, and and people who, you know, more or less the same people who get us into things like the Iraq War and and lovely situations like that. But the language fails us. Um, and, and, you know, when I met Tarek, I, you know, I had to apologize for the title of the report because we're not entirely, we are, we are talking about tropes that are applied to Muslims, but it's inaccurate because it encompasses Arabs who are not all Muslim. It also encompasses Muslims who are not from the Middle East. Um, we, we can talk about Afghans. We can talk about Persians. We can talk about Pakistanis. Also, when we think about 9-11 and the things that happened after it, right, people were attacked. Sikhs were attacked. They're not Muslim. Yeah. Latinos were attacked. They have, I mean, the, the completely different part of the world, overwhelmingly Christian. Um, and, and I just also want to add one thing, and, and I, I can't recommend enough, even though it's a bit of a, a, a slog of a book and a real kind of textbooky tech book, but uh, Professor Norma Salo's book, Palestine, A 4,000-Year History, read this, because what you learn about Palestine from his exhaustive, excellent um, uh, study of the history, the full history of Palestine, is that, think about where Palestine is. Palestine is at the center of Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, when, when, when Tarek mentions how, how Palestinians come in all different colors, with different hair colors, and different, you know, this is due to centuries and centuries. Who are the Palestinians? Palestine has been home to so many people. And this is what I try to get, um, you know, people who are, are near and dear to me who say, well, this is the Jewish homeland. First of all, if you look at Jewish history, we have a number of different homelands, and actually Judaism developed just as much in Persia and Babylon as it did in Palestine, uh, if not maybe even more. Uh, but that aside, clearly Jews have a deep, deep connection to that land. Of course we do. But many nations do. Many nations have called that piece of land home. And for much, most of its history, it's never been exclusively the homeland of one nation. Palestine has been a, a, a real and a true melting pot for centuries upon centuries, and the Palestinian people today reflect that history. So when people say, well, you don't want a, a, a Jewish state of Israel to exist, and all you want is a state of Palestine, therefore without Jews, that is nonsense. That is exactly, exactly the opposite of what Palestine has been historically. Palestine has been a Jewish home for centuries along with Muslims, along with Christians, along with so many other peoples. Um, and to recapture that history is how we settled this conflict. That history was lost because of Europe, essentially a European nationalist ideology of nationalism. 
And I, for one, you know, think that that is really where we need to attack, uh, ideologically speaking, the, the, the notion of what we're trying to do and reclaim the actual history of Palestine and who the Palestinian people are because the, Palestin the idea that there's Palestinians in, on one hand and Jews on another is simply wrong. Mm -hmm. Jews are Palestinian. Palestinians are Jews among many, many other things, and we need to recapture that. And, and I just want to add one thing because you were talking about the language and I wanted to bring it back again to what's happening here at home and how I actually experienced this in the administration because I, I realized I didn't actually talk that. about yeah, this was... part. And like if you look back at the statements from the White House, from the president over the last seven months, like you saw frequently the umbrella of Islamophobia trying to capture all of these different nuances of like the types of like discrimination and hate we have been seeing both on college campuses and just around the country. And it took a lot of conversations and work and educating and really great colleagues at the Department of Education. But like we were able to break through and there was a point where like the Department of Education through like its guidance on <laughs> Title VI and civil rights mm -hmm. in the context of the Higher Education Act, like we were able to articulate not just Islamophobia, but also identifying anti-Arab sentiment and anti-Palestinian sentiment in the context of like the discrimination that should not be allowed to take place on college campuses, though we continue to still see it every day. And so like for me, even though it was something that I was experiencing, even though it was something that I think people didn't quite fully grasp what they were doing by using like generalized language. It was something that we were able to break through and be able to have more legitimate conversations about the types of ways that people are impacted beyond like the simple umbrella. And so like, even though like Mitchell's report like does that, I think like he articulates it very well and also in the report, but like this is, like this is a continuously like growing and evolving conversation and it's an important one to have because this is not solely Islamophobia. This is a combination of uh, problematic hate and racism around like many groups of people. And it, even if you have to use a single word to identify it, it's really, really important just to keep kind of unwinding that because right. people need to understand that this is not a religious issue. It is, it, it is, but it is also many other things. Yeah, it's folded into the context yeah. of a broader yeah. issue. Um, Mitchell, I'm gonna pose one more question towards you and then I, I, we have a bunch of questions from uh, the, the audience. Um, you said in the past that the Biden administration is not only at fault for the way it's responded to and covered Israel's actions in Gaza, but the policies have helped create conditions that have led to both Hamas's attack and Israel's overwhelming response. Can you explain to me what you mean by that? Sure. Um, so this administration on this issue, I, I would argue on, on several issues, but none like this one, on the issue of Palestine has been an utter disaster. Um, Joe Biden has actually managed to make, to, to, to show that uh, there, are, there is a possibility for a Democrat to be just as bad, if not worse, than Donald Trump on, on this. Uh, he has been uh, just abominable, and it didn't start on October 7th. We can look at what happened since October 7th, right away, Biden repeated, uh, as Tarek pointed out, uh, Biden repeated Israeli lies, claiming to have seen decapitated babies, which was not true. Um, it was it was a bald-faced lie, and he claimed he had actually seen photos. <clears throat> so this is we, we see sort of what the man is, um, and and the depths the depths of his racism. But that was actually in evidence before uh, October 7th happened. His policies. Um, were basically to ignore Palestine. He came in after Donald Trump had had uh, made certain changes that alienated the Palestinians, um, angered them, and basically made it impossible to pursue any sort of diplomacy. Rather than reverse any of them, he doubled down on them. Um, he did not, he, the only thing that Biden materially changed was he restored some, not all, some of the funding to UNRWA at the time that, that Trump had cut uh, and to uh, some hospitals in East Jerusalem. Other than that, he refused to uh, 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 reverse Trump's 
de facto recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. He refused to, rec to reverse Trump's uh, recognition of Israeli sovereignty on the Golan Heights and a great many other policies, the closure of the, the PLO office here in Washington. These would have been complicated issues. Some of them involved congressional cooperation so that it's not like he could have just reversed them immediately, but he didn't try. He wasn't interested, and he was not interested in reviving a peace process. He said that. He actually said, well, the time isn't right to even discuss this. The time was apparently not right for anything. And what he, the time was right, as far as he was concerned was, for, was a deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, that would have removed from the hands of the Palestinians their last, literally their, their last real bargaining chip uh, in terms of, of diplomacy. Um, this, this is all they have. Saudi, Saudi partnership with Israel is the last thing that Israel wants that the Palestinians can help them get. So, uh, and Biden was going to take that away with literally nothing going to the Palestinians but some sort of lip service toward a two-state solution that hasn't been viable for years. So Biden, Biden put the Palestinians in a position. Now, I don't know why, what the thinking was, uh, obviously, <clears throat> for Hamas in doing what they did and the timing that they did it. Um, I can't say for certain, but it is hard for me to believe. And they, they've said that this was part of it. I, I, it is hard for me to believe that, that it wasn't a factor, a, a sense that, you know, if we don't do something now, the Palestinian cause, is, 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 uh, at least on the international diplomatic level, is over. And it would have been. It will be if there is a deal between Israel and the Saudis, the, the, the diplomatic efforts on, on behalf of Palestine are over. The only thing that will change the, the status quo is some sort of cataclysmic uh, uh, event, much like what we're seeing in Gaza now, which has, in fact, changed the status quo. Um, all of a sudden now, a lot of countries are very interested in revisiting the question of Palestine. They are recognizing that Israel has been dispossessing the Palestinians for decades and something needs to be done. We can't just go on this way. Israel managed to convince a lot of people that um, the occupation could be managed. That was the, the language that was being used. We can manage the occupation. Um, you cannot manage the deprivation of the rights of millions of people, period. You, there's no managing that. That will, will cause a background. And, you know, it, it's kind of stunning. Uh, we've seen it time after time when, when administrations have tried to move away from Palestine, have tried to move it out of the center. It always comes back, and it has now come back in the worst way. So... Um, you know, this was a conscious decision. Biden made a number of very bad decisions. It did not help that Biden also did not make any attempt to uh, revive the Iran nuclear deal. This is connected to that also, that, that raised the tension throughout the region and caused the situation now to not only be, uh, 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 not only threaten Palestine, but to threaten a, a massive conflagration throughout the region in a way it might not have if there was communication with Iran uh, and, and, and the, the sort of things that were happening under the nuclear deal. We can talk about a lot of those things, but ultimately the bottom line is that Biden tried to ignore Palestine. He tried to move past it. He tried to say it is perfectly fine for millions of people to live without rights, whether under siege in Gaza or under occupation in the West Bank, and that was never going to work. And because of that, um, that is, I'm not going to say that's the only thing, reason that October 7th happened, but it was a big one. Can I just add one other sure, thing? Sure, sure. I just, I just like bringing it back to like how this is affecting everything at home, I think that it is so important to also understand that there's a perspective here that is not being reflected by the Biden administration, by the president, based on the last seven months. And that is that the public perception of our involvement in what is happening in Gaza has completely shifted in a way that is actually extremely dangerous to the current administration's policies and to uh, American democracy as a whole. I think that it is so important that we also recognize that when people are trying to communicate with their elected officials, when you see poll after poll after poll of Americans across the country that are saying that they don't think that the handling of this war has been 
correct, successful, representative of their ideals or ideas, um, you know, I think that creates distrust in our institutions. And I think that's extremely dangerous when you're also talking about all of this happening in an election year. Like, I don't want to, like, turn this into, like, a political thing, but it is a factor here. It's something right. that should be, like, thought about. And we're talking about a president who has, you know, prided himself on being representative of the American people, but on this issue, he is not listening to his voters. He is not listening to the younger generation of voters who have probably the most diverse backgrounds and also the most extremely dissenting perspective on the issue of Gaza and on Palestine. Right. Um, we have a few questions. I'm, I'm not sure if we have enough time to answer all of them, but... Um, how one of the first questions we have are how might media attention on student protests around the world further Palestinian liberation? What advice would you give to activists facing claims of anti Semitism? And what's your response to the notion that such idealization or the hyper focus on American university students takes away attention or deters attention from the genocide in Gaza? I'd, I'd love to take this one. Um, so just I'll start with the last point first. Um, I think that what we're hearing, even just in anecdotal messages from people in Gaza who are seeing what is taking place across American college campuses, is not that this is taking away attention from them. In fact, it's elevating, you know, how they feel about this issue. This is something that is probably the most hopeful message that we've heard from Palestinians who are suffering from famine in Gaza, who are seeing you know, their friends and families being killed on a day to day. And so like the fact that they are saying keep going, I think that like, I think that should be the message that students are taking. Um, when it comes to the weaponization of anti-Semitism and what college students should be thinking about and like how they should be messaging, I think like the most important thing is that students understand that, you know, there is this weaponization happening and being clear that like, you can challenge ideas, you can challenge language, but also being very clear that like in your actions, in your words, like we have seen problematic language, it just hasn't been coming from students. And the fact that there is such clear message discipline, the fact that they have been to their core nonviolent and peaceful and anti-war in their messaging is very clear that they're obviously successful in that messaging and they're gonna be people who are going to try to undermine that and just recognizing that there are people out there who are um, who disagree with the actions and efforts that they're taking and feeling empowered by that rather than letting it undermine you. You're okay? Okay. Um, so uh, there are 37 Democrats who voted against the Ukraine-Israel uh, legislation. Um, it's unprecedented. So do you see the influence of organizations such as APAC and ADL diminishing in the future? Well, I think what they're diminishing now. Um, one of the big losses that APAC, uh, that APAC has suffered is that it has found itself forced to uh, become a lobbying organization, a, a, a political action committee. Um, it, it, up until a couple of years ago, APAC did not actually do campaign financing. They did not fund any campaigns. They did not give it. They told they told PACs where to put their money. Um, they they made it very clear they were very powerful in that regard. But they didn't actually engage in that behavior. Now they have to. Um, the reason they have to is because they're losing the argument and they don't. You know their basic uh, their basic uh, uh, tactic had been to uh, win through lobbying. Uh, but now, nobody really is very sympathetic to their cause. They are sympathetic to the money they can, uh, they can mobilize. That is, and so they have shed the, the sort of veneer. And when groups like that have to operate more out in the open, as we've seen, um, you know, APAC has become very famous all of a sudden. Um, it was kind of known, you know, uh, in the, in the, you know, uh, Israel-Palestine policy circles, everybody knew who APAC was, and then, you know, everyone was aware of them. But now APAC is on the, on the lips of everybody. Everyone is talking about, you know, we don't, we, we'll take APAC money, we won't take APAC money. It has become a, a point of controversy. So they're already losing the argument. The ADL 
Uh, and I'm sad to say this because the ADL has done some good work in its history on civil rights. But when it comes to anti-Semitism, unfortunately, they have never done what they should be doing, which is deal with anti-Semitism, not anti-Zionism. Anti-Zionism should not, should not be any of their business as a civil rights organization. If you want to be a pro-Zionist organization, be that. But do not try to mix that with civil rights work because the two things don't go together. So, um, and, and this has undermined their credibility severely. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when they, they, even Zionist organizations are saying, you know, th that they are exaggerating, at, uh, putting it kindly, uh, the situation for Jewish students on campus. They have, um, they have, undermine and uh, they have undermined their own credibility to the point where you can't believe anything that they say when they say anti-semitism has risen this much you have to wonder how many of those are just people saying uh i you know i, I don't think the state of israel should exist as a jewish state um is it you know when they when they talk about violent threats how many of those are simply people saying that israel you know that 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 palestine should be free from the river to the sea um, and and pe from people who are advocating democratic rights for every single person who lives between the river and the sea, including the millions of Jews there, um, they these groups are have have lost the battle. I think um, what they have on their side, however, is still a great deal of funding, and so it, it is not. You know, there are still groups to be taken very seriously, and there are still groups that can have a major major effect. Uh, but we're seeing people. You know, ultimately. Uh, one thing I like to remind people about when it comes to electoral politics, um, ultimately, yes, money is important to campaigns, but the money is only as valuable as the votes it buys. If it doesn't buy the votes, and we've seen this, we just saw Summer Lee uh, in Pennsylvania defend, defend her seat in the primary against a, uh, uh, a Democratic opponent who was funded by a man named Jeffrey Yass, who is one of the major pro-Israel funders uh, in the country and a very close ally of Netanyahu's. So, um, and, and she won easily. Now, well, we'll see what happens in November because we can be sure that, that she will still be targeted by pro-Israel money. Uh, and that would be an even worse loss, of course, because it's Republican. But, um, but, but again, money doesn't, you can look around at races. I've been engaging in this question for decades now. You, yes, money is important. Getting your message out is important. But who, who has and spends the most money does not equate anything close to all of the time to who wins the elections. And APAC is going to start losing the elections. So another question is, what are the implications for universities as they pursue uncon unconstitutional means of silencing students? How much activism can happen within the higher education sphere, and what are the limits? Yeah, it's an absolutely great question because it feels like we're reaching this inflection point where, you know, there's just activism everywhere all the time, particularly on college campuses. And I think like to the question about like, what is the impact? I think I said it was like an existential risk to the integrity of higher education, but I didn't actually talk about like the, the, like the systemic pieces of that or like the, the components of like the, possible violations of the law. And I think that's like a really important question. I think universities don't want to be seen as having violated civil rights laws. They don't want to be seen as having violated f uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. Like those are like fundamental tenets of not just universities, but our American society. And so I think like when you get that brand, when you are investigated for those possible violations, that's already really dangerous. And I think university leadership become at risk, but you also have like the possibility that like the, the fines and penalties are so extreme, I, not the fines per se, but losing eligibility for like Title IV, which is like access to Pell Grants and student loans, like that is a real, and legitimate like outcome that can happen if a school is found to be in violation of Title VI. And that doesn't happen often. And the fact that like that is part of this conversation, the fact that there are numerous investigations by the Office for Civil Rights into a lot of these schools and the possible discrimination, we're just gonna keep seeing more of these investigations happening. We're gonna see more complaints because we are watching it happen in real time. And those investigations take a long time and I think we're going to either get to a point where 
we start seeing real actions from the federal government against some of those violations, or alternatively, we see a point where universities actually come to the table and have real conversations about what it means to protect students' right to protest, student activism more broadly, and just having real conversations about that. We haven't seen that yet. I have a final question, and I think I saved this for last because it's most interesting. Um, Perhaps Tarek might not be able to answer it, but I believe Mitchell and I will. <laughs> Do you think Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism is worse now than during 9-11? Mitchell? Um, I mean, I, I, I can't say it is, it is worse than the immediate aftermath. The immediate aftermath of 9-11, uh, I mean, I remember this well. Uh, was uh, there was a feeling that I had, and, and and mind you, I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area, so about as liberal a place as you can as you can find at that time. Um, and there was there was literally I, I I felt literally a weight on my shoulders of the hate and the anger uh, that that was out there at the time. I was with Jewish Voice for Peace, and we organized a, a peace vigil in the wake of the attacks. And I mean, you know, <laughs> obviously I've been doing this sort of thing a long time. And even though that's 23 years ago, I've never had quite the vitriol I had uh, thrown at me during, during that vigil. Uh, people were just furious. Um, they were, and, and their fury was, was really taking on a racist tone, at least the white people anyway. Uh, and not only, not only, I shouldn't say, um, but, but that was just, the, the, the ones that I ended up hearing from were mostly white people. Um, it, so I, I can't say it's as bad as it was in those days. But after that, um, I mean, I think now we have such a, a concerted effort to demonize particularly Palestinians. Um, and I think that that's really kind of the thing. We, we've always, there's always been a sort of a special place in the heart of racists for Palestinians. Um, but it's really taking on, taking shape right now because how else do you justify, you know, the, the, the death toll, official death toll is approaching 35,000. Let's keep in mind, the Ministry of Health is where these numbers are coming from. The Ministry of Health has been effectively destroyed. Okay, they are not keeping up with all the deaths in Gaza. It is a virtual guarantee. There's also um, a, a great many, you know, at least 7,000, probably much more uh, people who are missing, uh, buried under the rubble. So now we're at, what, 41, 42,000. Then think about how many people aren't counted in those statistics. The people who are starved to death, the people who are dying from uh, preventable diseases, the people who are dying of, of malnutrition, thirst. Um, you know, various other so-called collateral damage uh, that, uh, you know, th who knows what the, what the final numbers are going to be. Well, how do you live with that? How, how, do, you, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you go to sleep at night and, and say that's okay? Because I can tell you, I'm looking at an awful lot of people who I thought were real liberals and real leftists who seem to be, and I'm not going to say they're okay with it, but they seem to certainly be able to live with it. It doesn't seem to be bothering them on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, how do you do that? The only way you do that is when you don't see Palestinians as people. So um, I think that part of it is clear, and I think it is, you know you can't keep that confined, obviously, just to Palestinians. So you know I think there is a I, I, I can't say that I would 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 say that the level of anti-Muslim or anti brown person uh, hate is quite at the level of 9/11, but when it comes to Palestinians, it's kind of reached a whole new crescendo. Do you want to take a stab at it? Yeah, I mean, I, I can talk a little bit about my personal experience. I was old enough to remember 9-11, um, unfortunately. And, you know, as a Palestinian, as a brown person living in the aftermath of that, even though I was only in fifth grade, you know, the amount of hate that I felt just for simply being brown, for people in my community knowing that I was Arab and like growing up in Southwest Ohio, there. There were some Arabs, but not very close and not that many. And in my school, I was the only one. Yeah. And experiencing that hate and vitriol every single day was not an easy thing for a 10-year-old, you know? Wow. That, was, that was something that really wore me down, made me realize for the first time that 
I was different. I didn't realize I was different before 9-11. Like, when that glass shatters for the first time, it is emotionally and mentally so distressing. And the fact that there are kids today that are experiencing that very same thing, and in some cases magnified because they are Palestinian and because what is happening right now, like Palestine is at the center, it's, it, it's heartbreaking to know that there are students out there that feel like they don't have an outlet, that they don't feel like they can talk to their friends because they are different and they are viewed as like less than human. And so I, I feel that very, very close to my heart. And um, yeah. No, oh, I, um, <laughs> the first time the glass shattered for me was during the Gulf War because I was in fifth grade then, but I was in college during 9-11 and I grew up in a very uh, uh, dominantly white neighborhood in Boston, Massachusetts. And I specifically remember the physical aggression um, people had towards uh, anybody of Muslim, Arab, um, South Asian descent. It, 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 was, it was a very troubling time. Um, but now one thing I've realized, and I'm sure you'll all agree with me, and I've said this over and over again, is that um, during those times we were taught to keep our head down and be apologetic about our existence, about who we were, and just kind of say, no, whatever's happening is really bad, and almost take an onus of responsibility of what was happening, even though you're so young. But now, the newer generations, especially using social media platforms, have really uh, changed this whole thing around and changed the narrative around, and they've been able to take the narrative into their own hands and be very vocal and unapologetic about who they are and what they stand for. And I feel like their peers are standing with them too. And it's a really beautiful thing that I'm witnessing. And it's heartwarming at the same time as it is sad for me to see these events unfold in the world. But um, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here and giving you. us your thank time. You. And thank you so much to those who attended.